I'm going to start for just a, a, a brief moment. You know, a few of you have said uh, a number of years ago I did these little liturgical moments. Um, and I want to do one again this morning because I think it's a, it fits a little bit with what I want to share share with you. Uh, you know, you ever wonder how we get um, the readings that we're going to be reading on any given Sunday or any given service? They come from what we call a lectionary. Well, many of you probably know this. Maybe all of you know this. I'm not sure. Come from a lectionary, which is a gathering, a list of readings, Old Testament, New Testament, Gospel, Psalms, whatever it might be for the day. And there's a list dedicated to Sunday services, and there's another list dedicated to daily readings, morning prayer, noonday prayer, evening prayer, things like that. And so we, those are all set up through the calendar of the church year. Remember, the church year starts in Advent, which is four Sundays before Christmas moves through Advent for, for those four Sundays, Christmas season, Epiphany season, Lent, Easter, and then we get to close out Easter season with, uh, tr uh, with uh, Pentecost, which we did two Sundays ago. Remember that? Pentecost Sunday. And last Sunday was um, Trinity Sunday. And then we come into a season that's called, well, a season after Pentecost or the se or ordinary time. It's other, other names. Colors change, things like that to help distinguish. And, but but we, uh, the, these lists of lectionaries uh, for the Sunday have a three-year cycle. Year A, year B, year C. You get to the end of year C, you start over with the year A, year B, year C. You get to the end, you start over again. The whole idea behind that, along with the daily lectionaries, is, for, is to guide us through basically reading the whole of Scripture, if we follow those, in a few years, okay? And so... The uh, reason I share all that is because today being the first Sunday of the season after Pentecost, if you will, some people would say, well, actually, Trinity Sunday was last week was that, but we always uh, observe Trinity Sunday on that day. So we're into this, this season uh, of season after Pentecost. We're hitting the meat of it, and it's year A this year. We're in the middle of year A, not year B, not year C. And so we come to some passages, most particularly this one from Genesis that I'm going to spend some time with you on. Genesis chapter 12, the call of Abraham, who's the father of faith and that sort of stuff. Abraham's a, an incredible guy. Um, and, and so, it, and this season is a season where it's primarily, my understanding is, it's dedicated to growth. Growth for you, growth for me, growth for the church, to grow, grow in Christ. And, and so... Um, it, it recounts these this, uh, these lectionaries recounts the salvation history by which we are helped in our discipleship. I don't know if that helps any with anybody how this comes. It might have been, okay, tell me that again, I'll take a nap. But anyhow, uh, that's one reason, one way we get to Genesis chapter 12. Again, two weeks ago was Pentecost. The Holy Spirit came on the church. Holy Spirit is, is the the, the way that an individual is saved because the very presence of God is placed within them, but also empowers them to live for Christ, to live for God, to do the things that God has called them to do. Without the Holy Spirit, we really can't live that life. And then again, as I mentioned last week, was, was Trinity Sunday, the, the truth about the triune Godhead. God the Father is the Creator. God the Son is the, the, the sacrifice that pays your and my sin penalty. And then, uh, obviously, God the Holy Spirit, our creed will say, and we say it quite often, the Lord, this, uh, the giver of life. And so we're into this season of growth, and we'll take that all the way down until the end of, well, close to the end uh, of November. With that in mind, maybe if some of you have heard this particular uh, phrase before, a statement, and I think it's worth pondering a little bit. Christianity is never more than one generation away from extinction. Have you thought about that? Christianity is never more than one generation away from extinction. If it could be that the church stopped talking about Jesus, stopped living by faith, Christianity would disappear. Unless by some sort of sovereign work of God, he were to present a Bible to somebody and they were to pick it up and read it and believe that believe what they read in it. But, but less something like that, the church, Christianity, is always one generation from extinction. And it's only by faith, it's only by faith that it continues. 
Some of you may remember uh, in Luke chapter 18, Jesus is, is talking and he said, and when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? He says, go read the, go read the context. Luke chapter 18, in which he, he says that, will he find, the obvious implication is, is that it may be far-fetched, but it's possible. It's possible. Okay. So what does it mean? to live by faith. What does it mean to have faith? You might say, Andy, we've heard this a lot of times, but I wonder, I wonder if we can't maybe hear it one more time, hear it a little bit more ab about it today. That's really when you think of the Genesis passage, the Romans passage, and even the gospel passage, <clears throat> faith is through all there, all, all over the place. The Romans passage that Paul wrote uh, there in Romans 4 expounds about how Abraham, uh, all about Abraham, and living by faith. I don't know if you remember that. Look it up in your, in your bulletin there, if you've got your Bible with you, and see the position of faith plays there. The gospel reading, interesting gospel reading. We have Jesus calling Matthew, Matthew from his tax booth. Remember, he had a great job. Well, the other Jews probably would have said it's not such a great job, but as far as the income goes, it was a great job. And Jesus called him, and he dropped everything. Dropped everything and he followed Jesus. Is that not faith? Sure looks like faith to me. And then we have this other little pericope, this little passage there about the ruler. If we look at that passage as it's written in Mark's gospel, we know the ruler is probably by the name of Jairus. His daughter has died, and yet he comes to Jesus. But if you come, she'll live. Is that not faith? And then, of course, the woman with the flow of blood for 12 years. He touches the garment. You can, you can just feel her whispering it under her breath. He just touches your garment. And I'll be healed. And she was. Was that not faith? Faith. Look at all of those things called for a response from all of, from not only from Jesus, but from others. But that gets me back into the Genesis passage. You know, there's so much I could say about this. I'll try to not uh, t tell you uh, everything that I've read. Uh, but at any rate, Genesis chapter 12 is the very first datable time in the book of Genesis. Okay? We roughly got an idea about when Abraham lived, Abram, and then became Abraham. Okay? But the first 11 verses, excuse me, the first 11 chapters is not really datable. We don't know. But that covered... If you're thinking about a, a young earth type, type of uh, um, a worldview, the first 11 chapters covers over 2,000 years of world history. But when we get to Abram, things change. Things change pretty drastically. You, we could say, I think it'd be pretty easy to say, that besides Jesus, Abram, again later named Abraham, is the most important individual in the Bible. He's referenced all over the place. We just saw it in Romans and things like that. Abram, second most important person in the Bible. You know, even though Genesis chapters 1 through 11 cover over 2,000 years, the life of this man covers a little more than 13 chapters. Just this man until he dies. And if you include his son Isaac, and then Isaac's son Jacob, it, it covers about 24 chapters. 24 chapters dedicated to this man and his, his offspring. Incredible when you think about it. Well, who was this guy, Abraham? Who was he, Abram? A couple things I can give you in the way of background about him. Um, we read from chapter 12. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house and the land to the land that I will show you. It's interesting that Stephen, you remember who Stephen was back in Acts, the first Christian martyr that was stoned to death? He says something just a, a, a little bit different. It might fill in the picture. Let me put it, say, fill in the picture just a little bit. Let me read you just a couple verses from his, his little talk. He's about ready to get stoned to death. And this is what he says. And Stephen said, Brothers and fathers, hear me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham 
when he was in Mesopotamia. Now, in case you're kind of fuzzy on your maps, Mesopotamia is roughly equal to about where Iraq is today, okay, roughly speaking. Was in, when he was in Mesopotamia, before he lived in Haran, and said to him, go out from your land and from your kindred and go into the land that I will show you. And then he went out from the land of the Chaldeans and lived in Haran. Okay. He was not in Haran yet. Land of the Chaldeans, again, Mesopotamia, that's kind of, again, roughly speaking, the day of Iraq today. So according to Stephen, the inspired word, God called him while he was still in, again, Iraq, I'll say, Mesopotamia. We see a little bit, we go back to, to this Genesis passage, and just prior to it, let me read you these few verses. Now, these are the generations of Terah. Terah fathered Abram. So, this is Abram's father, okay? Terah fathered Abram, Nahor, and, and Haran. And Haran fathered Lot. Haran died in the presence of his father, Terah, in the land of his kindred in Ur of the Chaldeans. Now, Ur, I hope it's, you're tracking with me a little bit. Don't go to sleep on me, okay? Nobody, no, nobody heads, nobody head by them. Ur is a city down in south, southeast um, Iraq, a little, bit, a little bit north from the Persian Gulf. That's the city. And so when Stephen talks about Her uh, uh, land of the Chaldeans, that's where Abram was. That's where he was when he got the first call. Let me continue. Haran died in the presence of his father, Terah, in the land of his kindred in Ur of the Chaldeans. And Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and Isaac, uh, and, and Iscah. Now, Sarai was barren. She had no child. Terah, again, that's Ab Abram's father. Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife. And they went forth together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. And the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Haran, again, track with me. Think of your map. Put a, put a picture of your map. It would be nice if I could put a map up there, but I can't do that. Anyway, think of Syria today. Syria today, and up at the northern border of Syria, right where we're just about ready to, to go into Turkey today, that's where Haran is. It's not the land of Canaan. So you see what happened here? God called Abram when he was way back down here in Ur. He took his whole family, or Terah, the father, led the family. They went up and they established uh, this, this town, Haran, named after his deceased son, Terah's deceased son, and they stayed there for a while. And then God calls Abram again. After Terah dies, God sent, renews his call upon Abram. And that takes us into chapter 12. The Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be, you will be a blessing. You know, God said two things there. Well, actually, he said five things. He gave him two commands, two directives. But then he said, out of those two directives, three more things are going to happen. Three more things. First directive, go from your country. Go. Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. Where is he going to go? We don't know. He doesn't know. What would you do if God said, okay, Linda, I want you to get up. I want you to sell everything you got. I want you to, well, take your family, and I'll, I'll tell you where to go, but just go. I don't know about you. I'd have trouble doing that. <laughs> I'd have real trouble doing that. But that's what God said to him. To a land that I will show you. To a land that I will show you. 
And from this, now let me get to the second directive before I tell you the, the next part. Verse 2 reads, And I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. Listen to this. So that you will be a blessing. That's the second directive. Get up and go, and you're going to be a blessing. Actually, those words, the word will shows up in that verse three times. You could take that word out, and it would probably give us a little bit better understanding because it makes us think it's going to happen in the future. But God is saying, no, I'm going to start it right now, basically. And I make of you a great nation, and I bless you and make your name great so that you be a blessing. Those are the directives. But the three things that God said, make a great nation, I will bless you, you Abram, and your name will be great. You know, it's interesting, you know how old Abram was when this happened? Well, we read about it a minute ago, 75 years old, something like that. Sarai, his wife, is barren. Do you think they've tried to have kids? Oh yeah, they've tried to have kids, but he's barren. And God says, no, I'm, I'm going to make your name great. How is he going to do that? How in the world is he going to do that? Well, you know, he doesn't tell us how he's going to do that, but he does give the directives. Go. He's just told nothing else. Go. To be a blessing. You will be a blessing. You know, the thought comes in my mind sometimes with the prevalence of Abram being referenced throughout the Old Testament and other places. I wonder how much Jesus paid attention to the life of Abram. I wonder how much Jesus learned from his obedience. You know, I could take you back and do a study uh, that he was probably, Abram was probably um, rev um, much into, to a significant degree, idolatry. I mean, think of later on, you remember the story of Leah and Rachel um, and how they were leaving uh, their home and they kind of snuck away and Laban, their father, went chasing after him because Jacob had carried him off and they said, you stole my gods. You remember that story? Yeah, yeah. And they had, they had stolen the, well, I can't remember if it was Leah or it was Rachel, it doesn't matter, but when, they'd taken some of these idols. Do you think that, that maybe that was still happening with Abram a, a little bit? I, I bet it was. He was basically from, because the very last chapter is all, all about, um, well, well, the Tower of Babel is the story there. Idolatry. God called Abram. But here's the catch. Not only did God call, but Abram did have to obey. He did. He had to do what he was called to do. He would only be the blessing if he left Haran and just followed what he thought was God's leading. Remember, he was told nothing else. The writer from the book of Hebrews, in chapter 11, writes this, verse 8 says, By faith, Abram obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as inheritance, and he went out not knowing where he was going. That's faith. That's faith. That's trust. Abram trusted God. It's not an easy thing. What if, again, he was probably rich, he probably had hundreds, if not maybe even perhaps a thousand or more people as part of his clan, not to mention all the, the animals to go with it, and God says, no, go. Take, you can take them, but go, go. Faith is stressed here, and it's even stressed in, in uh, chapter 6 of Hebrews, uh, excuse me, chapter 11, verse 6 of Hebrews. It is impossible to please God without faith, without faith. So faith is stressed through it all. You know, Jesus must have modeled his life again, as I said earlier, after Abram. He maybe imitated him. How would we imitate him today? Paul even says the same sort of thing when he writes to the church in Corinth. Imitate me as I imitate Christ. 
as I follow Christ. He not only said it to the Corinthians, he said it to the church in Philippi as well. Virtually the same, same thing. Imitate me. How is it that we follow Christ today? Paul also writes in Romans, those who are led by the Spirit of God, you've heard me say this before, those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. That implies those who do not allow themselves to be led, those who do not follow by, by the Holy Spirit's leading, maybe are not children. It's not just like I said that that opening sentence from uh, John MacArthur. It's not just to do these, get these certain things that we need. It's to learn about God and to find out how how to follow, follow in faith. You know, last week I, I touched a little bit on the problems that we've got in, in the country. If you didn't hear that, go back and listen to it. It's on our YouTube channel, the problems we've got in our country. How is it that we solve those problems? How is it that the church needs to embrace, and I'm not just talking about Solid Rock Church, but the worldwide church, but certainly the church in America, well, how is it that we so begin to solve those problems or make greater progress in solving those problems? Well, first, as Anthony just pointed out a few minutes ago, we don't cower to the culture. We take a stand. We take a stand. You know, um, this past week, two of our, my, our parishioners here sent me the same sermon to, to listen to. So I thought, well, maybe I better listen to this thing. I'll probably send it to you all, too, through emails. Do you all, do you all open those emails and look at them? Do some of you do? I know not all of you do. I know that for a fact, because <laughs> I can tell who opens and, and who doesn't open them. <laughs> I can tell that. Um, but I can't tell you rather how much time you spend there. That's, so aren't you glad? I don't know that. But at any rate, I'll probably put it in the email to you this week. And, and I really encourage you, listen to the whole thing. It's, it's not a 20-minute sermon, but listen to the whole thing because this guy nails it, nails it, nails it. And the two parishioners that sent it to me thought the same thing. But, but the, it, it ended with, with a few verses that I'm going to end with, with here. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10 to 12. Let me flip over to that real quick. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 to 12. Remember, I said... When Jesus, referencing Luke 18, will the Son of Man, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Well, he is going to come. Listen to this. He says, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done in it will be exposed." Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn? But according to his promise, we're waiting for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. What sort of people ought you to be? in life of holiness and godliness. Stand firm. Stand firm. If you know you're doing something wrong, stop it. Just, just Canon Bill says, now cut that out. We'll be here next week, by the way. But if you know you're doing something right, keep it up. And if you're not doing something that you should be doing, well, start doing it. Start doing it. Whoop. The next one verse is Deuteronomy chapter six verse seven. This is this is, and I think this may be a, a real important one. Deuteronomy chapter six verse seven. Well, I'm going to start at verse six. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house. And when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise, talk about them. And those of us like me who are children or out, uh, out and grown, figure out a way to check on them, see how they're doing. If you have grandchildren, help them as best you can. And I say this right in front of you, knowing that I got to do a little bit better job than that at that, because all mine are not here in town, and some of them are hard hard to get a hold of but I need to do a better job at that. 
2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, reads this. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, reads this. Well, the whole paragraph starts at, chapter, at verse 8. I'm not going to go through that. I'm going, to, I'm going to start at verse 11. For which I was appointed a preacher, an apostle, and teacher, verse 12, which is why I suffer as I do. But, listen, this is the important part. I am not ashamed... For I know whom I have believed. He's talking about his faith right there. For I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day when he has entrusted me. What did we sing that, that song we just sang a few minutes ago? Out of the hymnal, the sequence hymn? He'll take care of you. I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. You have been entrusted with the Word of God. You have been, we have, the church has been entrusted to live for Christ, to be the light, to be the salt. And if we don't do it, well, the salt doesn't work and the light doesn't shine. A little bit more. Ephesians chapter 6. Again, you'll be familiar with this a little bit. It's about the armor of God. I'm going to jump around just a little bit, skip a little bit. 10 through 13, and then 18 and 19. Finally, be strong in the Lord. Well, I wonder why he has to say be strong in the Lord, because they were going to encounter some persecution. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in, in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Did I say last week that that stuff that we're dealing with in this world is from the pit of hell? I think I did. If I didn't, I should have said that. It is from the pit of hell. And so we need to stand strong against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And he goes on to say, therefore, take up the full armor of God. Jumping ahead to verse 18 and 19. Praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication, to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. I'm going to go on to verse 20. And also for me that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. If that was good for Paul, do you think it might be good for us? Speak boldly in love. And maybe, maybe God will have, have mercy on us. All this is about living by faith. It's about living by faith. And for us to grow in that faith in this, this season after, after Pentecost. Well, how do you do that? Well, I'm going to end with this one thing that you've heard me say. If you've heard it once, you've probably heard it a thousand times. Read this. You like my new big Bible? I bet you've noticed that. <laughs> got a good deal on it, and it's got all kinds of study notes. But anyway, read it, read it, read it, read it, read it, read it, read it study it, ponder it, meditate on it, take your time, read it. Because if you don't read it, you really can't know God. Yeah, he may give you an epiphany sometime, but this is how you get to know the living God is this right here. You come to church every single Sunday and listen to me preach or whoever's here, listen to sermons throughout the week, but you, but you don't spend time reading the Scripture yourself. You're not going to have the strength that you need. You're not going to have the knowledge that you need to fight this present darkness that we're living in. You're not. And so you got to read. you got to study. you got to ponder it. you got to meditate on it. Just think about it. And so that may be the thing to, to, to concentrate on for, well, for the rest of our lives, not just this season, but for the rest of our lives. Ponder this. Study it. Because just as Abraham, Abram needed to obey God, we need to obey. And we can't obey if we don't know what he's telling us right here. Let's pray. Father God, the world, the world needs your message. And you have ordained that your message goes to the world through us, your church. For those of us sitting right here, those of us maybe living, looking on 
by video. You have ordained that. And so make us faithful, Father, just as you called Abram, probably a man with dealing with a lot of paganism, if not extreme paganism in his life, but yet you called him, you helped him to hear, he knew it was you, and he followed you, he obeyed. Do that with us, Father. Take away any unbelief that we may have. Tear down any walls of intellectualism that we may be putting up to keep you away from us, to keep you at arm's length. Come, Holy Spirit, and tear all that stuff down in our lives as individuals and tear it down in your church worldwide. Bring that revival. Come, Holy Spirit, because people, people matter to you, and you've called us to reach them. You called Abram to be a blessing to the world. And we are heirs of that blessing and heirs of that calling. Be glorified, Lord Christ. Come, Holy Spirit. Come and do some mighty work in your church. But we do ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'd please stand.